We Are the Words, We Are the Stories by Sarah Hilliard. We are all natural storytellers. This is one of the reasons why many teachers feel comfortable using stories in their classroom. When we teach through stories, not only do we teach language, but we, these stories have the potential to evoke empathy, compassion and self-reflection. The great thing is that this potential is also present in our own learners and their stories. And we can bring this love of stories into a love of creating stories. In this session, Sarah will look at ways in which oral production can be increased by giving learners a voice as storytellers. Sarah Hilliard is based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She has been a teacher and coordinator at pre-primary level and is now the ELT academic consultant for bilingual schools. She is tutor on Niall's online course, Teaching English in Pre-Primary Education, and is the co-author and series consultant for Pearson's new primary course, Little Stars, and uh, primary course, Our Stories. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Sarah Hilliard from Pearson Education. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this conference. I'm so very thrilled to be in Turkey at a distance. I've never been, so this is new for me. Um, and I'm so honored to be opening this conference with a session which aims at giving learners a voice through the use of stories. Um, I do have one complaint. It's way too early in the morning for me in Argentina. It's 4.45 in the morning right now, so it's dark here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you so we can give this a start. All right. There we go. All right. Um, so, we are the words, we are the stories. I'm just going to start with a little story, a story about myself in quarantine. Everyone knows what it's like to live in quarantine, but I'll tell you a little bit of my story. During quarantine, I kept looking out the various windows in my home, perhaps longing to flee, I looked outside the windows every day, seeing the seasons changing, discussing the details of my kids, trying to help them develop their observation skills. Leaves turning from green to brown, naked trees, sunlight getting brighter and brighter and darker and darker, the changes in weather. Looking out, I noticed how incredible nature is and how it has this power to make us feel better, contributing to our well-being. As I have no plants inside my house, I've recently ordered some plants to be delivered home to bring some nature indoors. I kept thinking how privileged I am for having this view in these times of isolation. But what I didn't know is that that was just the beginning. As from day one, my routine completely changed and I had to experiment with ways of balancing work and personal life in one same space called home. Well, personal life or family life, because you don't get much of a personal life anyway with a six-year-old and a two-year-old in normal circumstances, never mind life in a pandemic. Sadly, I noticed that for my kids, I was physically present, but I was also absent all at the same time. At least I saw them in person. All the rest of the people in my life were flattened into square screens. And that is how it continues to be to this day. Now, I would like you to uh, answer some questions. If you could just use the chat box, please. Um, just a quick answer, yes, no, just a word. No long paragraphs, please. Um, did you feel identified in any way with my story? Just an honest yes or no. There's no right or wrong answer, just based on your personal experience. Have you had a similar experience during quarantine? 
<laughs> lots of yeses. <laughs> okay. Did anything I describe remind you of something different you went through during quarantine? Perhaps something I described was not exactly the same, but it took you back to something. Some yeses. Okay. How did, no, good, okay. Um, how did my story make you feel? At any point of my story, you may have felt different feelings, contradictory feelings maybe. Just write the words in the chat box with no explanation. Sad, heartbroken, reflective, a little sad. I'm not alone, desperate, hopeless, <laughs> tears in my eyes. Oh, okay, good. Did any of the characteristic, did anyone, did any of the characters, sorry, any of the characters that are real, by the way, remind you of anyone in your life? Yes, someone's son, okay, lovely. Okay, so what we've just done is an exercise in empathy, compassion, self-reflection. You've listened to a story You've tried to connect with it, disconnect with it. It made you feel something. It made you reflect on a piece of your own life in quarantine. We all have a story to tell. We teach through stories, whether it's a story told by the teacher or the learner's own story creations. And the great thing is that there is so much potential for the classroom to become a place for turning a love of stories into a love for making stories. So this session is inspired by the idea that learners are storytellers and we want to give them a voice. So this is what we're going to be doing today. I've started with my story. We're going to have a look at other quarantine stories and we're going to see how we can work with, with stories in the classroom, different ways of doing it, embellish it, frame it, guide it, feedback into it. And um, everyone has a story to tell. So it's important that we all share our stories and that we encourage that in the classroom as well. So we're going to look at some ideas for story building to see how that can happen. So um, I decided to begin with something that we can do in the classroom that connects life in quarantine to life, returning to school settings. Hopefully learners will be returning to their schools. So I think this could be perhaps a nice smooth transition. A great place to start with self-reflection and empathy towards others is each of our personal experiences during these trying times. So we can begin by reflecting with learners about life in quarantine. And I'm sure we've all got lots of stories to tell. Look at these. Um, this is someone in Brooklyn who says, during the quarantine, my boyfriend and I saw our little friend growing and growing. He feels really good next to our lower basement window. This reminded me of something. It might seem that during quarantine, our world stopped turning. So it feels nice to see that nature never stops growing. This plant feels the same as before our isolation and its world did not change at all. That makes me calm down and reminds me that even though we might feel a little bad sometimes, it reminds me that we are not alone. The world won't stop turning and nature is there right in front of your window. I can find some similarities in between this, the, between this story and mine, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, there's bits about nature in my story as well, but it's not exactly the same, is it? This is taken from Quarantine Stories Today. The Quarantine Stories Project is a platform that collects stories of isolation as a result of quarantine. So people from around the world are asked to take a picture of their view from the window or what they see from their houses and upload it to the platform together with a personal story. Stories connect human beings and they're how we make sense of the world. And what more effective than a pandemic, unfortunately, to connect human beings around the whole world. Have a look at another one from Spain. She says, this lady is my mum. From one of my windows, you can see her kitchen window. Every day when we go out to applaud, we greet each other. And that raising of the hand and that applause is like a very strong hug. That's a different, very different story. 
Um, another one. A few major things make me go out and see what's outside my window. The moon, colorful sunsets and the trees by my window. No matter the weather, these trees always look phenomenal and stand out. I can't say much about quarantine life because I kind of lived that before it was the rule. But the biggest change used breakout rooms to try to make sure learners are in smaller groups to try to promote more interaction. Yes, um, some teachers have tried their best to encourage learners to speak in front of their whole group of screen mates. But um, we find sometimes they're not confident enough to do this. And this is their face in the end and their attitude. Um, the feeling of exposure can be very strong. Parents might be around, older siblings, um, and talking to a screen is not really very humane. So we want to go from this, I think, to this if possible. And we want our learners to feel safe again. So the point of this session is that many teachers have noticed that in online lessons, students' oral language skills are not developed enough. So perhaps that's one of the key points that we should focus on as we return to school settings. So maximizing the time we give to students to use English to express themselves should become key, more so if a back to school entails a hybrid format. Do as much speaking practice as you can at school and then leave the rest for the online. Um, so how about asking them to bring a photograph um, looking outside their window, find out what we all had in common and what was different in our experiences. And um, so the idea of accompanying the story with a visual is very typical of digital storytelling. So again, we're taking something which is usually seen online, something digital storytelling and seeing how we can include that in the classroom. So going from the digital to face-to-face -face classroom as a smooth link. Um, so having a visual to accompany our stories is a way of embellishing it as well. And there is something that you can rely on to tell your story and help others understand it. So it's an aid for uh, comprehension in the classroom as well. Um, we all will also want to frame, frame it for them. So it doesn't have to be anything long. Never mind if it's a short story, if students only have time to tell a short story each or they're at a level where they can only tell a very short story um, or adapt it to younger learners. Talk about what you like about looking through your window or what you like and you don't like. Something as simple as that. We don't want it to be intimidating. We want them to get used to speaking again. So perhaps a, a STEM sentence to get them started during quarantine, I or my, from my window, I see, just something simple like that, something basic. You can also teach story openings and closings. Um, so to open a story, for example, which is the standard opener, the one we all know from traditional fairy tales. Let's see if anyone can think of what's the standard story opener. Yes, once upon a time, that's it. It's a good one, it serves the purpose for a fairy tale, but sometimes you might want to try something different. So, did you ever hear the story of, or everyone knows, that's one I used, everyone knows what life is like in quarantine. Um, I will tell you a story that was told me when I was a little girl uh, or a little boy. It is said that, so you've got different story openers, depending on the level of your students, of course. There are story closings. So traditionally, tales often end with a tagline to let listeners know that the story is over. What is the usually the, the usual closing in fairy tales? Once upon a time opened, and yes, they lived happily ever after Aleph. Excellent. Um, it's perfectly good, but you might want to try something different. And so the story goes. And now the story is yours. I like that one. You're transmitting a story and now the story is yours. And that is how it is to this day, one that I used. And that's the end of that. Or, and that was just the beginning. I used that one as well in between the two parts of my story. And they lived happily ever after. Or if they didn't, it's none of our business. A bit of humor in there. But notice the and in every one of those. So you end the story and you say, and da, 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 da. 
Okay. Um, it's interesting um, when you look at the structure of a good story. Some people have stopped using the words uh, rising action or climax or falling action, resolution, but now uh, some people are using COVID related terms to structure a good story. I was reading about um, a storytelling consultant called Kendra Hall, and um, she breaks down the simple beginning, middle and end as normal, explosion and new normal. So the normal sets the scene, the explosion disrupts normal, something happens and reality as we now know it has changed. And the new normal is the setting the characters have had to adjust to living in. So we can also use those COVID terms. Um, so when we want to guide it, we can brainstorm some ideas that, uh, we, that learners might include. What would you include in a story um, about what you can see through your window? Description of nature, maybe transport, people you see walking by, feelings. Um, so when asking learners to tell a story, it's important to limit the scope for them a bit and guide it. So this is it, not just tell me a story about quarantine, it's too broad, but bring a photograph of what you can see out your window, what you could see when you, when you were isolated, narrow it down for them. Tell me that story. Um, feedback into it. And this is something that's quite nice to do orally as well, if we're looking at uh, developing the oral skills. So we can practice listening to others and responding by giving oral feedback. So it doesn't always have to be from the teacher to the learners, but learners can give peer feedback, can't they? So what can we teach learners in terms of oral feedback, depending on your learner's level of English and age? It could be something like, I liked your story. I enjoyed that, or I felt the same, or I will pay more attention to nature from now on, whatever the focus of the story is. So we encourage proper listening, uh, not only listening to stories told by the teacher, but their peers. Um, and I think it's more important now than ever to listen to learner stories and to empower them to give, uh, to share their stories. Um, and storytelling provides an opportunity to, that, that reminds us of the, common ground that we all share, although the stories themselves may be different. So storytelling, which is different to story reading. So this session is not about story reading. We're not reading stories or reading storybooks. It's about storytelling, telling stories is one of those great strategies a teacher can use to help obtain oral language practice. Um, at a variety of degrees of language levels. Young children tell us stories all the time. They want to communicate their stories. A first grader told his ouch story. First, I fell and hurt my knee. Next, I cried. Then I got a Band-Aid. Finally, I felt all better. Good use of sequencing words. First, next, then, finally. I'm sure most first graders would connect with this boy's story, empathize with it, feel compassion, self-reflect about the time when they experienced an ouch story. And when I say anyone can tell a story, it really means anyone. Three-year-olds tell stories that are called leapfrogs. Their, their stories are connected in their own minds, but adults see them as hopping from one event to another. I went to the doctors, Marvina came to my house, I had cake for breakfast, and that's a whole story for them in their minds. But for us, it's different events. Um, Four-year-olds tell chronologies, um, and then, and then, and then, and then stories, stories that go on for a long time. At age five and six, children start telling classic narratives with a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and they usually say, the end, at the end of it, don't they? Um, so, very, very young children can start telling their stories as well. Um, so everyone has a story to tell. But why should I tell my story? Don't hold on to your story like a selfish child holding on to their toy, not wanting to share it. In the same way, Nancy Sinatra says that those boots are made for walking. I say stories are made for telling. 
because after nourishment, shelter and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. So don't keep them to yourselves. Use them a lot in the classroom. Um, remember you're a role model. The more stories you tell, the more stories your learners will tell. You are developing a love for listening to stories and a love for sharing stories if you do it a lot yourself. So you should share your story, you and your learners, because it helps to reduce negative attitudes and stereotypes. We might think someone is very different to us, but when they share their story with us, we open up our minds and start recognizing connections like you did with my story. And we can relate with compassion, with empathy. We can start imagining how it would be to be in the shoes of others. Stories help connect emotionally and emotional connection means that we're more likely to remember something. We want learners to um, recall learning. Um, using a story can open up a whole new engagement with you, your peers, with the content. Um, and, and the story can hook your learners and aid their relation to the topic with that emotional connection. Sharing stories builds community and a strong classroom culture. That's why it's also interesting to do it face to face if possible, because we're all there together um, physically and, and united as a community. Stories uh, can make us laugh together. They can make us cry together. They can make us be angry together. Telling stories is a large part of what makes people connected. It's a unique creation, which makes it special. Um, the story itself is very personal and unique and the way you tell your story is too, there's a sense of ownership. It empowers and builds confidence when you have an audience being interested in what you have to say and as a learner, seeing that you're able to speak up and use the language you're learning to express yourself is a very strong feeling. Learners are developing their ability to understand, to um, retell, to act out, um, create their own stories in English. And this has a very positive effect on their motivation and confidence and, and their self-esteem. And yes, it helps you practice oracy and language skills too, helping learners to communicate more creatively and effectively in English. So all in all, we teach through stories. Not only do we teach language, which was only my last point, but stories have the potential to evoke empathy, compassion and self-reflection. When we come back to the classrooms, we want to work together as a community. We understand more about ourselves. We learn more about our own relationship with the world and we understand others better. So stories are effective as educational tools. Educational, not just linguistic. And one of the great things about it is that um, storytelling is a very portable device. You can do it anywhere at any time. You don't need anything else but yourself and someone to share with. Um, it's a bond, it's community, it's about the people. So we don't need course books or resources for this, just the members of our classroom community. Success depends less on materials, techniques and linguistic analysis and more on what goes on in and between the people in the classroom. And I think that's something that we should take into account nowadays more than ever. So now we're going to have a, a look at four ideas for story building, for turning a love of stories into a love of making stories, ways students can build and create their own. So this is my first idea. Stories can start from the moment students enter the classroom. You take a large piece of paper and tape it to the wall. And once students enter the classroom, hand them a marker and have them think of a hashtag that describes themselves. Allow them to write their hashtag on the wall, uh, on the piece of paper on the wall, and then what they will do is explain it to the rest of the class through the means of a short story. So it's a little monologue and they're giving it a title by using that hashtag. Of course, this is something you would do with learners who know what a hashtag is and use hashtags. Um, it's as simple as that, but the hashtag is what makes all the difference. And when you've got a poster uh, of the class hashtags, you've got a poster of the class stories, all those stories in one same place. So they're all 
um, collaborating to create that one poster full of stories. Um, Selson says, my favorite activity, my students love it. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> um, this um, next activity is a variation on hot seating. And I've included, and now the story is yours, which was, which is taken from one of the story closings that I mentioned at the beginning. And now the story is yours. So originally hot seating is a drama technique in which a chair is designated as the hot seat and a character from a story sits in it. So a student becomes a character, sits in it and is questioned by peers and will answer in role, remaining in character. So they could become Humpty Dumpty or they could be queen, they could become the queen of England. They, they can become, um, anyone, any, any character, and they're questioned by their peers. This character can be a real character. Um, it could be a story they've heard. It could be based on a character in a story or a film. So questions would intend to um, get information from the character, find out the character's viewpoints, their motivations, getting their interpretations. So it's a great way of um, understanding characters and useful for questioning skills as well. So for this variation, where we have, and now the story is yours, you're going to write that on the board. And now the story is yours. So learners don't forget to use that expression at the end of their story. That's gonna be the, the closing for all these stories that they're gonna tell. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use learners' personal stories instead of uh, a book or a film. But they're not going to sit in the hot seat yet and tell their own story. Instead, they're going to tell their partner's story. So they will be in pairs. Student A is the original character who tells story, uh, student B their story. Something, it could be something that happened to them. It could be a dream they've had, whatever. Um, at the end of their story, so student A is telling their story to student B. Student A, when they finish their story, they will say, and now the story is yours. So now student B has that story. So student B will become student A as a character. Um, so student B will sit in the hot seat and will retell the story in character as their partner. As the point of hot seating is answering in role, they will put themselves in the shoes of their partner, become their partner to tell their story. So they introduce themselves as their partner. So I'm Sarah, right? So I'm not going to tell my story as Sarah. If my partner was Maria and I was in the hot seat, I would say, hi, I'm Maria and I'm gonna tell you my story. One day I was, so the rest will ask questions about the story while I'm telling it, and they can ask anything they like. So this is where it gets fun. So they might ask, what was his name? Was it sunny or cloudy? What did he answer? What did you eat that day? What's your favorite color, Maria? And I might not know the answers to all those questions. So if I don't know the answer because Maria didn't mention it, I can make it up. It can be logical or completely crazy. When Maria tells the real version afterwards, Maria will come, student A will come to the hot seat later and uh, will tell their original version. So we can compare similarities and differences. So putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, we can, um, we can experience the story as one's own. Sometimes some learners feel safer talking as someone else as well. Young learners um, often experience that rather than telling a personal story about themselves. They feel safer talking as if they were someone else. Um, they'll tell their story, uh, but in the intimacy of the pairs and then only later in front of the whole group when their story has actually already been told in one way, one version of their story. So it can help them build a lot of confidence. So this idea of now the story is yours is quite nice, I think. Okay, um, and now, the, um, yes and. The first time you play this, you might want to make it easy. We're gonna have a little, uh, we're gonna try and see if we can do this. Okay, so you're going to have the beginning of 
the story. And your students are going to continue the story by saying yes and. Okay, so this is a collaborative story. Uh, so the only thing I'm going to ask you to do right now is to write in the chat box a sentence that starts with yes and that connects to what I'm, I'm saying. Okay, so this is the beginning of the story. Once upon a time, there was an orange chimpanzee. Okay, I'm accepting suggestions in the chat box, please, starting yes and. Once upon a time, there was an orange chimpanzee. Okay, let's see if we can get some suggestions starting. Yes, and, okay, yes, and what was his name? Yes, and he loved oranges. Yes, and he liked to play with friends. Yes, and her little son. Yes, and he was my best friend. Yes, and he was afraid of something. Yes, and he could sing. Okay, let's see if we can get some action in there. And what happened in this story? Okay, what happened? Oh, yes, and he went to school with me. That's a good one. Okay, so following on from yes, and he went to school with me. So what happened after that? So once upon a time, there was an orange chimpanzee. Yes, and he went to school with me. Yes, and he wanted to change his colors at school. So how are we going to change his colors at school? Yes, and we got a lot of paint out and started painting the chimpanzee. Okay, um, so we're creating a collaborative story here. It usually begins as just a sequence of different sentences, like we started out with. Just yes, and he liked this. Yes, and he did this. Yes, and th this was his uh, name. And yes, and. Um, so it's just a sequence of different sentences, really, that are disconnected. But then what we want to uh, start to do is try to make it a bit more challenging by changing the rules slightly. So each sentence must refer to the previous sentence. For example, once upon a time, there was orange chimpanzee. So the next person might say, yes, and the orange chimpanzee liked to drink tea. So the next person will have to say something about drinking tea. Okay, so what could that be? Once upon a time, there was an orange chimpanzee. Next person. Yes, and the orange chimpanzee liked to drink tea. Who can tell me a sentence starting with yes and that would connect to tea? The orange chimpanzee drinking tea. Yes, and drinking tea alone was not fun. Thank you. Um, so then someone would have to say something about alone, being alone or not having fun. Okay, so that's where you start connecting the story. So that makes a big difference. It's not just a load of different sentences all put together, but now it's actually starting to make a little bit more sense, even if it's a nonsense uh, opening to a story, of course, an orange chimpanzee. Um, but then if someone forgets to start their sentence with yes and, then the group functions as a, a friendly human buzzer. <laughs> so everyone uh, or whoever notices that the, the learner has not said yes and they go buzz, and the learner just then tries again. Okay, it doesn't mean, oh, you're banished. You did not play the game properly. Um, it's just, they can just, it's a reminder. That buzz is just a reminder. And at any time, if a participant cannot think of anything, that's fine. They can say pass if they get too stuck and it's the next uh, student's turn. So we don't want it to be intimidating. We want them to feel safe um, when we're back to face-to-face. So that they, they don't feel um, like that it's it's something that is too challenging for them or something um, uh, that, that they're not enjoying. So um, the next one I've got, which is the last idea for today, is Jabba Talk. Ask them to create their own unusual foreign language, or just use an unusual or funny voice, uh, or just different sounds to create their nonsense language, one that no one else in the classroom can understand. So learners can give their speeches in their made up language, tell stories in their nonsense language. So they could be a leader of a group who gives a speech to his people or a storyteller from a tribe that is telling a story in their traditional language for tourists. But what you need is groups of three because you will have three roles. 
A will tell the story, student A will tell the story in this unknown language, whatever, any unknown language. Student B will translate the story into English. So that's where you get the English practice. And student C acts out the story or does sign language, gestures, actions, and movements. So you have those three roles to make this comprehensible. So you've got the visual in the drama that student C is providing. You've got the uh, musicality in the unknown language that student A is providing um, and student B is translating into English. So um, for younger learners, it can be as simple as an animal talking about themselves in their animal language and their peer translating, a cow mooing something and uh, the other giving a translation in English. Uh, so that's another very simple one to do. So those are the four ideas for story building that I included in this session today, plus the quarantine stories with a visual as you would do in digital storytelling for a smooth transition back to face-to-face. -to -face. So you've got five really there. So just to round up, I would like to know um, what is your biggest takeaway from the session? So if you could write that in the chat box, please. Um, it might be a story building idea that you would put into practice. It could be a tip or a concept that you would want to remember, embellish it, frame it, guide it, feedback, um, openers and closings, a reason why you should tell a story that you wouldn't want to forget. Anything um, that you would like to take away from this session. Jabba talk is my favorite right now. Lovely, hashtag and hot seating. Okay, uh, lovely. Great, the story building ideas. Most of you like the, the ideas, the practical ideas. That tends to be the, the norm, isn't it? You want something to take back into the classroom. That's lovely. Jabba talk, hashtag, fantastic. Comprehensible input, story building ideas. Lovely. Okay, fantastic. You can keep going if you like. Um, so to round up, the idea is that um, we are all natural storytellers. As Margaret Atwood would say, you're never going to kill storytelling because it's built in the human plan. We come with it. Very simple, but active and accessible. Thank you very much. Yes, and sounds good, Jabba Talk. Fantastic, all of them. Great, Unal, lovely. Okay, I hope that you have taken some ideas with this. Yes, power of stories, thank you. Um, and uh, that you can work around this, hopefully uh, returning to school settings. So um, within us, live the words that we want to bring to life. Give your learners the space and the opportunity to find their unique voices as storytellers, as creators, as individuals. Everybody um, has a story to tell, even the youngest learners. And stories empower us. They move us, they inspire us, they teach us. We are the words, we are the stories. So happy storytelling, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>